Remember the pyro incident? Don't forget it, okay? I've been really used and abused my whole life. And now, every time that I pick up a pen, I can't get past it. You really decided to remind us of the Aunt Margo incident and the biro pen? The joke Christmas gift? Right now when you're trying to call in air support? Good morning, how are you doing? I'm so glad to see you. Happy Sunday. Welcome to another episode of I'll Spare You the Details. And in this episode, we are going to talk all about how he's finally going to Afghanistan. Okay. We've been waiting for him to finally get to the war zone. He's been through boot camp and then he was rejected because his position in Iraq was disclosed to the media. And so then he received all these threats. So the last time we were together, we read all about how he was raging in the streets for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was the fact that he just realized mommy was dead 10 years after the fact. And so then that gave him cause for a lot of tantrums. And then we read about the fact that he was losing it because he had trained to take all these men to Iraq and then they snatched that exciting and thrilling proposition right out of his hands and so now he has nothing to do. And instead of going to them and saying, okay, well, since I can't do that, what work can I do? He raged in the streets, he partied, he beat people, he ran down to Africa, hung out with his girlfriend. And when he got done with that, after he drunk himself into a number of stupors, he decided that he would crawl back to his colonel and say, get me work. So he goes to his colonel who then gives him the very coveted position of an FAC, which is somebody who calls in air support. This job required a lot of training, which he did not have, and so he had to go to the Yorkshire Dales and train. During this training session, he spent a bizarre chapter telling us about how he was annoyed that Pa had not come to visit him since Pa was just a hop, skip, and a jump down the road. And when Pa did decide to come by and visit his dear boy, Harry spent a chapter describing how he pretended to kill Pa as Pa was driving away. So, his faculties are in question, as they have been this entire book, but we realized in our last book that he is slipping, slipping, slipping away from us. Um, his rage was really extreme in the last section. The relationships that he's having are not going well. He and Chels have had a difficult conversation in the last book. They had not broken up and they are not broken up yet, but she wanted to know, okay, so where is this going? And his response was, well, I mean, I have to do this thing with the war and with the training. And if that means I don't have anything left over for you, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Sorry. I was literally what he said. I just don't have anything left over for you. So I don't know what to say. Sorry. Okay. I, I, you know, she should have slammed the door in his face when he showed up dirty and disgusting and drunk as a skunk on her doorstep. But she has plotted along with them. And to this point, she's continuing to say she'll stick by his side. So... That's where we left off last time. Now has come the time when he is going to be uh, going to Iraq. He's completed his training and he's ready to be given way too much responsibility. Um, before we begin, the subscription situation is not all that it should be. Now friends, let's have a little fireside chat, shall we? You know and I know what the numbers are here, okay? These videos, these long videos, the long ones are getting like 5,000 views. Okay, well, you know, in YouTube numbers, that's not great. But at the same time, this channel is less than a month old, so I'll take what I can get. And meanwhile, the subscription number is just hovering at 2,000. Now, you know, I don't mean to be disgusting and talk about numbers and things like that. What a tawdry little conversation we have to have. But at the same time, I'd like, you to, I'd like to call you to better, okay? You are one of the 5,000 that continue to watch these videos time and time again. You see them come up and you immediately click on them. I know you do. You can't wait. And neither could I, quite frankly. If I were you, I would be running. And yet you have not clicked the subscription. You have not clicked the bell for notifications. And as far as I know, you're not sharing. Can you live with yourself? How do you put your head on the pillow at night? I just, you know, I want to alleviate the guilt that is reigning in your heart right now. I know you feel guilty. And quite frankly, you should, but you can make it better. You can make it better right now. There's the button right there. Oh, wait. <sighs> Doesn't that feel better? Don't you just, you feel proud and you should. 
And now that you've clicked the subscription and notification buttons, you will not only know when these videos come up, you will know immediately when these videos come up. And you don't have to wait any longer. You don't have to keep scrolling, looking, or typing in my name, looking for the channel. No, now I come to you. Isn't that lovely? Okay, um, let's come back on over to the book. Okay, he begins by telling us that he and his crew of um, soldiers are going into a C-17 to fly to Afghanistan. Now, they all have to lay on the floor of this C-17 as one does with your baggage and your luggage and all your little accoutrements. There they are like a bunch of animals in the bottom of the C-17, but not him. He gets snuck in secretly. No one knows he's there. He gets to sit and lay down in the little bunkhouse right behind the cockpit. What a cozy little time for him. And presumably he had it to himself, so I don't know where the captains were sleeping or, or the, where the pilots or the co-pilots were sleeping. I don't know because he had taken up their space. He gets to lay in the bunk and as he's laying there thinking about how they've taken all of his bags and they've taken his guns and how he is no longer protected by bodyguards and freaking out a little bit, he remembers Chelsea. He starts thinking about their little goodbyes and he starts thinking about the fact that the papers at home have all been reporting lies and falsehoods saying they've broken up, but they haven't. They're still together. They've had some rough patches, but they're still together, still chugging along. She's still believing that he can be somebody. And while he's thinking about all that, he's also thinking about the fact that he feels very unsafe and unprotected. This is the first time since that night when he was wandering the streets in Paris. Oh, that's a little side note about that, by the way. Can we just all agree that that didn't happen? Okay, he wants to say that the night he found out that mummy died, he ran out of his hotel room. His bodyguard was slumped in his chair asleep. And he runs down through the hotel, out the doors, and wanders the streets till the sun comes up. And I want to call foul on that story. There is no possible way that the prince has only one bodyguard in that building. Let me tell you how this works. There is somebody outside the door. There is somebody in the lobby of that hotel. There is somebody down the street. There is somebody in the in the hotel across from the street, okay? I do not want to hear any more of this talk about how there's only one person watching him. I know the way these things work. And this would not be one of them, okay? So the story where he was wandering the streets, okay, he might have thought he was alone, but I'm telling you what, there was somebody trailing him at least a block behind. So whatever. But he goes on this long stint about how he, he was feeling particularly vulnerable because they'd taken his guns and put him in a little box and put him down in the hole with all the rest of his things. And this was the first time he was ever going to be alone without an armed guard. Did they not realize who he's traveling with? He's traveling with the military who has sworn their allegiance to him and his family. Okay, armed guard. There's no armed guard for me. Who do you think all those lads are down there in the C-17? Always these, always these little statements about how he's just alone in the world, you know, struggling on. Just please, that's ridiculous. So anyway, then to continue on with his whining and complaining and his outlook on this whole thing, he starts talking about before he had to leave, they told him that he had to finish his will. JLP, his private secretary came to him and said that he had to go over his will and, and, and tie up loose ends in the will. What? Why are you asking me about my will? Why? It's, that's so morbid. I, you know I don't have much to give and you're already trying to take what I have and, and parcel it out to everyone. I don't know where I want to be buried. Well, Frogmore is sort of a nice place. I might go to Frogmore. But you shouldn't ask people that. What is wrong with you? Okay, well, what's wrong with him is the fact that everybody has to be asked to finish their will. As a soldier, that's what you do. You have a will. Like, that's just common procedure. He's just blown away by everything that's normal. I don't know. Okay, I said this to somebody in the comments. The thing that's going to be really frustrating for all of us in this whole section is the fact that Harry talks about war like an overeager 14 year old who's watched too many war movies and who has gotten really jacked up on the soundtrack and the special effects, but who actually has no concept of what war is. He romanticizes this whole thing to the nth degree. Every little bit of detail where he can be like 
shocked emotionally or where he can feel a flood of emotions, he really goes in hard. And he just like, it, it, it's just so, it's, it's so gross. This, this whole section is just so like annoying because it's written from the perspective of somebody who hasn't actually seen the ravages of war or experienced the hardship or felt the mental burden of the unseeable. It's, it's just so juvenile. It's embarrassingly so. And I just, I mean, I'm telling you, I struggled to get through this portion. My friend had told me that it was less whiny. Okay, well, it's less whiny, but there's this whole sort of braggadocious sort of, you know, bravado, this entire chapter. And it just rings false. All of it just rings false. And I'll tell you this too, okay? As I've mentioned multiple times, my husband was in the military. Okay, he fought in Iraq during the surge. And so I... As his wife, have lived on many a military base during my adult years. And I'm telling you that there is no soldier worth his salt who would talk like this. None. Now, I've known soldiers that talked like this, and they were an absolute pariah to everybody else. They were despised. They were loathed. Because the soldiers that talk like this are never the soldiers you could depend on. They're never the ones who you would rely on in battle. They're always the ones that are the cowards. And so I read these passages, and I just think to myself, I know your sort. Okay, you're, you know, you're, you're dropping your little words, you know, you're, you're, you're using your little terms that you've picked up so you can like feel like one of the guys. But when the real emergencies come, you will not be anywhere to be found. You will be crying in a corner, rocking back and forth. Without fail, that's the sort of person this is. So if you can handle that, keep watching, keep listening. Okay. Anyway, we've got to pick up the pace here. He, so he's devastated that somebody's asking him to complete his will. What a wild concept that is. And um, then he's like, oh, then, now we're landing. Amid these thoughts and recollections, I managed to doze off for a few minutes. When I opened my eyes, we were swooping down to Kandahar Airport. Time to put on the body armor. Time to put on the Kevlar. Look at him using his little words. Time to put on the body armor. Time to put on the Kevlar. I know some words. I know some stuff. Uh, he goes, then they hand me a vial of morphine to keep on my on myself at all times. Because cause now, we were now in a place where pain, injuries, and trauma were commonplace. Hey, you know what? Tell me something I don't know. You just entered a war zone. Do you need to tell me that you had just come to a place where pain, injuries, and trauma were commonplace? Also, what is this bit about a vial of morphine? Is that typical? Y'all, in the comments. Okay, no one's handing out vials of morphine to the soldiers, to the American soldiers that I know of. Is this like a special privilege for him? Is this like a British thing? Like, here, have this in case somebody can't get to you in time? I don't know. I, people in the comments, you would know. Tell me. Because I don't believe this his vial of morphine. It's just so dramatic. Like, did he read that somewhere? Did he read somewhere that somebody had had, had been given a vial of morphine? I mean, that just sounds like World War I in the trenches, where like, no one's gonna be able to help you, so we're just gonna be, you know, handing things out so you can help yourself. It's just ridiculous. Okay, so he says he got there um, to wherever it was that he was supposed to be going, um, to the base, there's no one there. He's like, well, you know, what's going on? Is everybody, uh, what's happening? And they're like, everyone's out on a mission. So he sits down to eat their cold dinner like Goldilocks. And he's sitting there shoveling cold pizza into his mouth, waiting for somebody to tell him what to do next. Then he finally gets uh, taken in a Chinook over to Forward Operating Base Dwyer, where he is going to be working for many a day. It's terrible there. It's a Spartan environment. You have no hope of staying clean or warm but you can at least try to stay warm. There's no hope of staying clean. So he says within a few minutes, he's caked with this sand that is like as fine as talcum, <clears throat> as fine as talcum powder. And it's a bleak existence that he describes. Everything is sand colored. Every, everyone is, there's sand in your food, there's sand in your eyes, there's sand in your mouth when you sleep. It's sound mind numbing what he was doing. You know, he's sitting in this little room, monitoring these radios, monitoring this, um, news feed, this, this video feed, and just kind of waiting for something to happen. Trying to stay awake. But he says this one line, and I thought to myself, well, I guess you just don't understand how serious your job really is, or how difficult it actually is. Because he says, 
that, you know, he just sat there and it really wasn't any, it wasn't any harder than being the air traffic control guy at Heathrow. And I thought to myself, you don't understand how difficult the job of an air traffic controlman is. Like that's, when you look at the jobs of the most stress, you look at the list of the most stressful jobs, that job's always at the top. They also have the highest rate of suicide. So it's like, I just feel like you need to take your job a little bit more seriously. And if you would compare it to an air traffic controlman and say, oh, it's no more important than that, then I guess you don't even understand the that. I mean, if you can't see how important that job is, you definitely don't have any concept of how important your job is. Anyway, he, you know, says a lot of annoying things. Like now he doesn't call food food. It's not dinner. Now it's chow. It's just like he is a lover of terms and words because as we've said many of the time, whatever environment he's in, he tries to shape and mold himself so he can fit in. And I haven't really made a point of this throughout all the chapters. I mean, I've noted it to myself, but I haven't noted it to you all. Every environment that he's in, he always tells us like what words they used for things. Like when he was at Eaton, we did talk about how they called cigarettes cabbage, but he had like a whole list of words like that they would call their teachers, that they would call their schoolwork, all this done stuff. Then when he was in um, Australia, he has a whole list of little terms that they would use, little words, slang. Then when he was, um, I'm trying to think where else he was, um, there's an, there's another time when he does the same thing. Now that he's in the military, he's now he's going to be using all their slang. And it's just annoying. I find it to be a very annoying that he does this. Anyway, so now he's going to go get himself some chow. Not dinner, not supper, not any normal words. He's going to go get some chow. And I, here's the thing. I've always hated that word. So maybe it just stuck out to me now that he used it. Um, then he has another little sad sack passage where he says that in the middle of the base of Dwyer, there was this post and um, on the post were all of these arrows and all of the guys had written, you know, their home, not their home address, but like their hometown and how many miles away it was. Well, he thought about putting his up, but he's like, I couldn't put Clarence house 3,459 3, miles away. I couldn't put Clarence house because I couldn't endanger all the lads. But it's like, okay, well, nobody's telling you to put Clarence House. Nobody put their actual home. They put where they were from. You could have put London, England. Why, why are you acting like I wanted to be part of it, but I didn't get to because, you know, I was gonna endanger everybody if I told everyone where I was from. Why are you always looking for reasons why, why you don't get to be included because you're royal, so that means you have to be different. Just don't put Clarence House, put somewhere else. You could have been involved in it. You could have done it. Then he says this whole thing. And I realized as I was reading, I was like, you know what? I just, it's like, it's my heart and mind so turned against Harry that nothing he says will, will pierce my hard heart. Because he wrote his whole passage where I thought to myself, if anybody else had, had written this, I feel like I would have had some sympathies for the soldier who endured this. Now listen to this. He says here, he's talking about the guns that are constantly firing. And he says, nearly every day, several times a day, Dwyer fired off these big guns, lobbed massive shells in a smoky parabola towards Taliban positions. The noise made your blood stop and fried your brains. One day, the guns were fired at least a hundred times. For the rest of my life, I knew I'd be hearing some vestige of that sound. It would echo forever in some part of my being. I would also never forget when the guns finally stopped, that immense silence. It's like if anybody else had written that in any other war memoir, I think I would be like, I would be ready to, to have enormous sympathy for the young soldier who was enduring for the first time the real sounds of war. But when Harry writes about it, I'm like, I, I really want to be sympathetic I do because he is a human being but when Harry writes about this all I can think is stop trying to talk about things that sound hard and emotional like stop trying to play on my sympathies it makes everything too dramatic and he begs you to care too much and when he continues to ask you to care it just all it makes me want to do is not care it just makes me want to say oh, stop it stop it stop it stop begging me to care Tell me the story and as, just tell me what happened. Stop trying to manipulate me because when he, 
I feel like that's one of the reasons why my heart is so against him in this book because I just feel like it's one long manipulation after another and if there's one thing that is going to make me turn against somebody faster than anything it's if I feel like they're trying to manipulate me okay um so then he talks about the guy that he worked with also a balding redhead they found some camaraderie in their unfortunate appearances he goes on and on some more about how hard it was to stay awake that doesn't make me feel better Gives us some more lists of words, his new words. You don't call the TV monitoring, monitoring the TV. You call it watching kill TV. All these boring little asides. Um, okay. Now we come to this passage where I think Harry has a real hunger for power and in a really unhealthy way. And again, remember the time when we, we heard about how he was pretending to kill his dad in the last, I mean, I've referenced it already, but that to me was startling that he, when power was given to him, something that he feels like he's lacked his whole life, he becomes very frightening with that power. And he writes about the fact that, um, you know, he's in charge of the restricted operating zone. So anybody who flies over has to ask permission to come in and he has to give permission. He has to say if it's safe, he's got to give them all of the info. Okay, and he writes, he says, I like this role, keeper of the ROZ, which is the restrict operating zone. Um, I like the idea of working closely with top guns, being the eyes and ears of such highly skilled men and women, their last link to terra firma, their alpha and omega. I was Earth. Okay, already, that passage is so annoyingly written. You're the alpha and omega. Okay, well, um, you might want to remind God about that because I think he's already taken the title. Um, he says that it just gave him this enormous sense of importance. And the problem is, is that he was enormously important to these people, but I don't feel like he, I don't feel like he was ever looking at his job as how can I aid people it is how can they aid me in my sense of self? That's what I get this whole time. And it's just, it's just maddening. It's maddening to me. It's like people are not on this earth to serve you. If he had for one second taken on the idea that he could serve others in any capacity and stop constantly looking for how can people pour into me and make me feel seen, imagine the person that he would have been. Really, quite frankly, imagine the person we would all be if we looked at serving others as some sort of way to live. But okay. All right. Do you, okay. Listen, do you guys remember the story when, um, Aunt Margot gave him the pen? Do you remember that? I think we all recall that. Okay. It's one of those stories that has come out and much has been made of it. And as we've said many of the time, and every one of the comments keeps reminding everybody, they would give gifts. Um, the Royal family gives jokes, joke gifts, gag gifts at Christmas time. Right. And it was weird enough that he made a thing of it before. But y'all, he's about to bring that back up again. And I just, okay. Why is he doing this? Why? He, it was already ridiculous that he was complaining about the fish pen. And now here he is in Afghanistan trying to aid all of the aircrafts in the air. He cannot be thinking about foolishness. But here we are, right here. Listen to this, he says. After receiving permission to cross my airspace, a pilot wouldn't always cruise on through. He'd arrow through, and sometimes his need to know the conditions on the ground would be urgent. Every second mattered. Life and death were in my hands. I was calmly seated at a desk, holding a fizzy drink and a biro. Oh, a biro, wow. But I was also in the middle of the action. Okay, he just stopped this incredibly important passage about the importance of his job to remind us of the biro incident. <laughs> how, how, how can he think, how can he ask us to take him seriously? What was the point and purpose of that little reminder? You guys don't forget, okay? People have been really mean to me my whole life. Remember the biro incident? Don't forget it, okay? I've been really used and abused my whole life. And now, every time that I pick up a pen, I can't get past it. You really decided
decided to remind us of the Aunt Margot incident and the Biro pen? The joke Christmas gift? Right now when you're trying to call in air support? Oh wow, a Biro. What an adult. Okay, so he says, um, I confess I was happy. This was important work, patriotic work. I was using skills honed in the Dales and at Sandringham and all the way back to boyhood, even to Balmoral. There was a bright line connecting my stocking with Sandy and my work here now. I was a British soldier on a battlefield at last, a role for which I have been prepared all my life. That's great. I'm so glad you feel a sense of importance and worth. That's great. And finally, you're being a man. Good for you. But why does he say at the beginning of this passage, I confess I was happy. You confess your sins, not your successes. So what is he like not? Is he proud of himself? Is he not proud of himself? I don't understand. Does he understand? How can he lead us through his life so that we can see the man he's become when he seems so muddled and befuddled about the details? Okay, so then he goes on and on about like, this was the most normal he'd ever had and what sort of a tragic upbringing has he had when being on a battlefield is the first normal he's ever known. <laughs> Cry me a river, don't care. Um, sometimes he got to call back to home. He would usually call Chelsea and, or Pa. It was Chelsea or Pa. But Pa said to him, um, that he would rather Harry write him letters, that he loved his letters. So he didn't have to waste his minutes calling him because, you know, they had those phone cards. You write me letters, dear boy. I love your letters. Write me letters. Okay, that is so touching because his father probably saved all those letters because Charles is a very, 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 very affectionate man. In all of my readings about him, even as Harry tries to throw him under the bus time and time again, all I'm getting from this man is like, I dearly love him. I just think he is so so kind. He just seems so kind and affectionate and affirming and gentle. And I don't like Harry cannot even manage to make him look like this bumbling buffoon that he seems to have wanted to make him like all I, I never really had much of an opinion of Charles one way or the other. And quite honestly, years ago, I sort of thought I didn't think much of him because of the whole Camilla thing. But as I've read this book, even under the opinion of somebody who really just seems to have grave issues with her father, I'm reading it thinking, man, I really like this guy. He's so lovely, such a lovely man. Anyway, there is, Harry doesn't say anything negative. He's like, leaves it hanging in the air. Like tried to call my dad, but he didn't even want to hear from me. He told me to write him a letter. <laughs> and we all know how Harry feels about letters being the illiterate that he is. They don't mean much to him. Um, Okay, and now we come to some more ramblings of the insane mind, okay? Let me read something to you. And let me, like, just listen and just with, do me the favor of commiserating with me as I try to get through this ridiculousness. He says this, that he was, there was a particularly really, uh, like a really dangerous position in the mountains where new Taliban recruits were given a gun and then they were supposed to try to get through this area without being killed by the Americans. Okay, so I guess it was the right of passage and he writes about it like this. He says, um, this was an entry point for new fighters. They'd be issued an AK-47, a fistful of bullets and told to head towards us through their maze of trenches. This was their initiation test, which the Taliban called their blooding. Were Sandy and Tiggy working for the Taliban? And then he goes on to continue with the uh, scenario in which a young recruit would get through the American line. And then he says um, that many a time he would, you know, they didn't, the Taliban didn't try to collect their dead. If you were dead, too bad for you. And he goes, I watch dogs the size of wolves, too many a recruit off the battlefield. Not a word here that that would have been a traumatic sight to watch dogs feeding on off of human bodies. He just sort of brushes past that like those crazy dogs were always chewing on someone's leg. But it's like this whole, I mean, that whole passage was like, <laughs> are you with us, dear boy? Do you need a white jacket? Should we call someone in? Do you need to be restrained? The Taliban called it their bloody. We're Sandy and Tiggy part of the Taliban. <laughs> And then 
And sometimes I'd sit there and watch dogs eat human bodies. Not a word about that. But he was devastated when somebody asked him to finish his will. But he's good with watching human bodies being eaten by other animals. Um, then he t wants to, to let us know that it just wasn't hard enough work over there at Dwyer. He needed to get into some real serious business. Other people were asking to be able to, to be let go. A lot of other people were wanting to get out of there. A lot of other people couldn't take it, but not him. Not him! He was going to go in for the real thing. And he wanted to go see some real war. And he was feeling like he was being held back. But not anymore. Not anymore. Because now, because now he was going to go to some real fighting. He was actually even calling some planes to do some damage. Okay, so they, of course, grant his wish. Whatever Prince Harry wants. And, um... He talks about how they sent him over to Operating Base Delhi. He tells us all about the people there. Apparently there were some Gurkhas there. Now Gurkhas are people who um, have worked for the British soldier for centuries. And they're from Nepal. And they are some of the best soldiers that have ever fought with the British Army. I mean, they're like legendary. Okay, But they also have a deep and abiding respect for the royal family. And... Harry Wright said it was kind of embarrassing because they would follow him around all the time and call him Saeed. And um, they just really loved him. Now, he's not derogatory about it. Um, he uh, he is a very appreciative of their respect for him. But he just, you know, goes on for a bit about how uh, they just wanted to follow him around all the time. Okay, well, sorry. Sorry that there's people who love and respect you. And, I mean... Um, then he tells us this story about how the Gurkhas love to cook, especially some goat curry, and how one Christmas a helicopter actually dropped a goat to them, to the Gurkhas, and he had been invited by the Gurkhas to uh, slit its throat so that they could begin to cook up their goat curry, and of course he wasn't going to do that. Um, he says that much like when he was in Australia and he was supposed to be snipping the balls off of various animals um, and couldn't do that he drew the line here too because he didn't know what he's doing and he wasn't gonna make anybody suffer well then why did you write this book because you're making me suffer but he was real big into not making people suffer so um, he didn't go up he didn't go in for that um, and then we'll, we'll we'll end with this story the first time that he had ever been called upon to arrange his first airstrike. He wanted to drop a 2,000 pound bomb on this one bunker where they had established that there were, there was some t Taliban um, foolishness going on. They had established the fact that it was, there were, were no c civilians, there weren't women, there weren't children. There was, there was nothing in the area that would uh, lead anyone to believe that this was possibly maybe just a family living there or a community living there. No, this was 100% Taliban. And Harry said that he advised that they drop a 2,000 pound bomb. Now he said, granted, every FAC wants to use every um, bit of power at their disposal and sometimes they can go overboard. But he felt like if they didn't do, if they didn't drop all they had on this bunker, then it would, you know, bust up the bunker, but no one would really be killed. Not all of them anyway. He wanted to get all of them. So he says that he was advised by the Americans who were flying the mission that they didn't need to do that. They needed to drop two 500 pound bombs. Now, Harry says, I felt strongly that I was right and I wanted to argue, but I was new and I lacked self-confidence. This is my first airstrike. So I just said, roger that. Okay, immediately when I read that, I was like, oh, I know where this is gonna go. It's not gonna go the way it should go and because no one would listen to him, you know, he was ignored, and then, of course, the mission fails. I knew that already. I knew that going in. As soon as he said, I felt strongly that I was right, I was like, oh, okay, well, we all see the way the wind blows here. Because there's, there's, the, there's no story he's told yet where I didn't see the ending coming. So, of course, they don't heed his warning, and because they would not heed him, it's a failure. They drop their little 500-pound bombs, and the Taliban come running out. So... He says he knew his bigger bomb would have done the trick, but next time he's going to trust his gut. And he's going to make sure he tells people how it is. Um, and we'll leave off there. Um, the next time we come together, he'll still be in Afghanistan, but by the end of the next video, he will be out. And so will we from this 
terrible torment it's been to follow along. Um, I, you know, the thing, the sad thing is, is that I really liked Harry growing up. I mean, I didn't follow he and William as equally and as closely. Um, I remember growing up just thinking William was, you know, really cute. Um, and I remember liking to see what they were up to. Um, but then as I grew older and became less enamored <clears throat> with things that weren't in my actual world and decided to plug into the actual world, um, I lost sort of sight of what was going on with them, but I always thought that Harry seemed like a lot of fun. And I always thought that he seemed down to earth. And whenever you see clips of him, like I remember seeing one clip of him, I don't know when this was, but he was on the sidelines of some basketball game or something like that. And he and some little kid were sharing a, a bucket of popcorn. And it's like this really cute little moment between them. And you, you see, you would see a lot of videos like that of him just being so comfortable with children and he seemed funny and he seemed like a lot of fun. He seemed like a breath of fresh air. And I think that this book is the detailing of somebody who has forgotten that he ever was a breath of fresh air in any capacity. Because now all he wants to do is whine and complain and cry. And it's just so sad because I don't think there's anyone who really disliked Terry. I think everybody in the whole world was pulling for him especially because his mom died when he was young. But I feel like, I feel like he's just leaned into this identity that nobody relates to. And we all wanted the best for him. We all wanted him to find somebody that he could love and marry and, and have a life with. But now whoever this person is, whatever identity they have taken, all it's doing is pushing us away and he seems to think that no one loved him and everybody was always against him. But I just think, where did you learn that? Where, where did you come up with the idea that everyone was against you? And that it's just you soldiering on through the world, you know, trying to find, trying to find somebody who will just give you a little pat on the back to just help you keep going. I don't know. Anyway, um, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. I'm looking forward to some more interesting stories on Tuesday. Um, and I will see you then. Have a good Sunday. Bye-bye.